Welcome to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County, and this show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month tells a story. Interest rates, low inventory, and holidays keep the numbers down. This show is being taped in November. We're going to be talking about the October numbers at the Registry of Deeds. So re recording level has been down this year. 592 deeds in October, less than the 661 in September, 15% less than last year's 695 deeds, and uh, year to date we're down 19% in sales. Um, you're also going to see a listing of all the sales for all 27 communities in Plymouth County, from Abington to Whitman, Plymouth and Brockton have the higher number of sales. Uh, mortgages have been slow. When the rates went up, refinancing stopped. And so you'll see the numbers relative to past years are down. 1,046 mortgages recorded in October, less than the 1084 in September, down 18% compared to last October, but year to date down 38% um, over last year. Uh, we follow foreclosures very closely since the meltdown in 2008. Uh, the numbers are very slow. Uh, when we were in the COVID period, there was a moratorium on foreclosures and they're very slow to come back. Only 16 foreclosure deeds throughout Plymouth County in October, same as the 16 in September but more than last year's 12 foreclosure deeds. So you were up 36% year to date. And a number everyone should follow very closely are the foreclosure notices. A foreclosure deed is when property has been taken back by the lender. A foreclosure notice is when the foreclosure process is starting. If you're in some difficulty with your mortgage, reach out to a federal housing counselor as fast as you can because there may be some way to modify your loans. Um, 38 foreclosure notices uh, in October, a little bit lower than the 39 in September, and year to date we're up 22%. So you also see an image of all of the foreclosures and foreclosure notices and deeds throughout Plymouth County, again, Abington and Whitman, and you still see a lot of zeros because of the moratorium. But Brockton, Plymouth, and Wayham traditionally are the ones that have the most in the most first uh, to get to, to higher levels. So if your property, again, if you're facing any difficulty, reach out to a federal housing council like NeighborWorks and see what they can do for you. Just quickly, we offer a free fraud alert on our website. A lot of people are concerned about stories they hear about fraud in land. Um, doesn't happen that often, usually between family members, unfortunately. But if you sign up on our website, PlymouthDeeds.org, go to fraud alert, put your email in, and when anything gets recorded against your name, you'll get a notice and you can take action. My guest in segment two is Deborah Colinino, who's a senior loan officer with Shamrock Home Loans. We'll be talking about some changes to her company, but also how to go about getting a loan and the trend now in loans throughout Plymouth County. See you next segment. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. Um, I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This segment about the show is always educational in nature. We've had surveyors, appraisers, commercial real estate brokers, and a lot of people involved in different parts of the real estate business. I have a great repeat guest today, Deborah Colonino, Senior Loan Officer with Shamrock Home Loans, and we're going to hear some information today about what is going on in mortgages and loans 
uh, in our marketplace. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. So why don't you tell our viewers a little bit of how you got into the business that you're in? Um, I started off as a realtor uh, way back in 1985 and uh, did that uh, for quite a while until like 1997. Took a little bit of a break and then um, came back in on the mortgage end of things as a loan officer in 2005. And uh, so I've got about 37, 38 years of experience in this field. Um, and they go hand in hand, real estate sales and loan officership in, you know, because you, they are a, a blended uh, teamwork situation. So um, it, was, it was a pretty easy merge. Um, I have been working for the company I'm with right now for since what, 2011 and a um, couple of bumps, you know, changes here and there, but came back to them. And then we just had, Shamrock Home Loans just had a significant change uh, last week. We uh, merged with CMG Financial, so we are now Shamrock Home Loans powered by CMG Financial, which uh, took us from being a, a lovely smaller company, which was number the number one mortgage company to work for in the country in 2022. So we are very proud of that. Um, and it gave us the added uh, programs and um, financial backing from the larger nationwide company of CMG, who also services uh, all the, you know, their loans. So that um, really has been a big improvement for us. We have over 800 programs that we can offer, wow. Wow. and some of them are um, sole proprietorship. There's some that we have that no one else can offer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's a really uh, important thing to have in this market when it's very competitive and um, people are looking for the very best program and the very best rate and things that, ne that need to sometimes be a little bit unique um, to make things work in today's market with, the, with our current rate structure and, and uh, inventory issues. So we can get into some of those specific programs, but let's talk a little bit about where we are in the uh, mortgage business right now, it seems to have slowed down from our end of recording because a lot of the refinances dropped out yep. after the rates went up. Uh, where do you see it with your company? Um, well, you know, the our company, like like all companies, it, it, we definitely experienced a, a dramatic decrease in uh, refinances. Everybody that could refinanced when the rates were at two, three, four percent, and um, mo which was most people. And so a lot of um, the, the refinance business now is on hold. And the only people who are refinancing right now are the ones who need to take cash out, maybe do some debt consolidation, because while interest rates have gone up on mortgages, they've also gone up on credit card debt mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. So if you have a lot of equity in your house, some people are choosing to do a cash out refi. Mm -hmm. um, and that that seven and a half to eight percent rate is still lower than the 29 percent rate you're paying on your credit cards. Right. So um, that's you know where the refis are at the moment. We are seeing um, a lowering of rates over the last few weeks. Um, the last year has been very volatile. We, um, a lot, you know, a lot of um, interest rate being raised, which really doesn't have anything to do with the Fed raising, but it's a trickle down effect. If the Fed raises rates, uh, it affects the bond market and the stock market, and that's what affects um, interest rates indirectly, the, t the 10 year bills and the, and the bonds and things like that. So. You know, it's been very volatile, and, and we're, hope, we're hoping that that's going to slow down, and we're starting to see a little bit of um, better uh, pricing um, in the last week or week to 10 days. Um, it's not going to predict, everybody is predicting that we're going to go down to, to, to lower rates, but we are not going back into that 4% area. That was an artificially lowered um, intentionally lowered. Yes, yeah. our, and and it was it was kept there probably too long, mm -hmm. and um, so when they did start going up, it was painful. Mm -hmm. People weren't ready for it, and it happened really fast. So uh, it, it really uh, took a lot of people by surprise. Now, if you don't mind, what is your uh, thirty-year mortgage, the flat regular thirty-year mortgage rate today? For a purchase, thirty-year fixed rate with no points because I don't recommend people pay points mm -hmm. right now, but with no points, 
Um, I locked a client the other day at 7.375. And what about a standard 15 year? 15 years are running about 6.5 in that ball with no points. Um, again, you know, it's uh, credit score driven, but that would be, you know, like the ultimate, the best case scenario. Yeah, there aren't a lot of people that remember the days when they were 14 to 18 percent, but I do. I do. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of people that have, that have remember those days, you know, kind of were very happy to have the threes and the fours, but realize that isn't always been the case. And it makes it difficult for um, people who are currently like first time buyers right now because they don't have that historical perspective to look mm -hmm. back on. Right. When I bought my first house, I paid 10% rate mm -hmm. and we were happy to have it because they had been 16 and 17. So, um, you know, if you're coming from a market that's been at the 4% and 3% rates, right. you're, uh, you're frightened by anything that goes up into the sevens. And, and you're calculating uh, what amount of house they can't afford at the higher rate. That's, that's one of the issues. It is. It has taken a lot of buyers out of the qualifying range for our general area. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Massachusetts, we have um, higher pricing due to lack of inventory. Mm -hmm. And so we have more buyers than we do houses for them to buy, mm -hmm. which keeps the, uh, the cost of the housing that is, that is available uh, higher. And um, then we wind up, you know, having multiple bids and that makes it go higher. So um, a, a lot of people have been saying to me, well, I'm, I don't want to buy a house while rates are where they are. I want to wait until they come down, which is really a mistake because while you're waiting for rates to come down, prices are going to continue to go up. And uh, a half, a per, half of a percent rate drop would not save you enough money it, it, when the property pr that you're buying, it goes up by ten or $20,000. It winds up being a wash. And so waiting, buy the house now at the lower price, refinance your rate when they come back down. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I've been um, trying to explain to people. I've had realtors come on the show and they said, date the rate. Buy the house, marry the house, date, date the rate. Date the rate. Yeah. yeah. And then refinance it when you find a place that you're really happy with. Right. Right. You know, everything, your whole picture. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that, um, that I love about the company that we just merged with here is um, we have a program that if you buy your house using us as your lender, you have, uh, we have a program where for five years after you make your sixth payment, you can refinance as many times as are feasible um, for no closing costs. Wow. Big deal. So yeah. that's a big savings yeah. and that's a big incentive for people um, to to go ahead and buy now and then refi later if it's not going to cost you anything to do so. So people are always told, uh, get your house in order if you're going to start looking at a house. And um, many, if not all, realtors won't even talk to somebody without a pre-qualification or pre-approval. Pre pre-approval, yeah. Pre -approval there is a difference loan. between the right, two, yeah. yeah. So pre-approval loan. Yes. So how would someone approach you and what would they need to have in order to get pre-approved by your company? Um, it's really not as complicated as people make it out to be. You need to know what your income is. You need to be able to show me pay stubs mm -hmm. and um, W-2s and in some cases tax returns, mm -hmm. uh, depending on whether you're self-employed or how you declare your, your income. Um, so that I can calculate what your true income is. And then um, I need to see bank statements so I need, can see how much you have put aside mm -hmm. for um, down payment and closing costs. And uh, the, one of the errors that people make now is they think they have to wait and save up 20% for that, and they don't because we have programs available where you can buy with no money down. Right. There are down payment assistance programs. There are multiple um, ways to configure a loan that you can do it um, with very little or no money out of pocket to actually purchase a house. But the same as you would spend um, on a first, last, and security for buying, for d doing a rental. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they should uh, reach out to their loan officer and go with someone that, um, you know, that works, you know, who your realtors recommend. They usually will recommend two or three ones that they have a history of working with because the, um, you want to work with someone that um, 
has experience and that they, the realtors will only recommend someone that they've worked with because they know they know how to do their job. So when someone calls you, do you tell them, give me A, B, C, and D? Yeah, the first thing the first thing I do is we'll have a 10 minute conversation where I ask them about themselves and I say, you know, what's your current situation and where do where where do you look to go and how long do you think it's going to take you and um, so I'm going to send them an application link and uh, they can download the link and fill it out and then I'm going to run credit and we have a couple of choices I can run a hard credit pull that which gives me all three bureaus or I can do a soft credit pull which gives me one and we'll have a, a good idea of where they're at. I highly recommend doing this sooner than later because if you have things that are on your credit that need to be fixed mm -hmm. or need to be worked on or improved, I can also look at your credit report and say, if you do A, B, C, and D, mm -hmm. your, sh your score should come up this much. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it might take time to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm not gonna do anything for a year, now is the time to mm -hmm. start. You want to give yourself plenty of time to get ready because a year goes by very quickly and you need you might need six months to get your credit squared away there might be things that are are simple enough to fix but they take time mm -hmm. so I highly recommend um, starting a year ahead so you so you pull someone's credit report mm -hmm. and it shows some issues mm -hmm. um, they take care of it and then what happens at that point um, I, I say to them, okay, your credit score is good, your income qualifies you for this much of a loan, you have this much for a down payment, um, I'm going to recommend that you go, ha go ahead and start looking at houses. And I'll issue a pre-approval letter. I like to do it a little differently. Some lenders will send out one letter saying uh, the maximum that you're pre-approved for mm -hmm. and send that to the realtor and say, okay, go ahead and look at this. I prefer to have a conversation with the realtor, send them an email, giving them the information of the highest amount. Mm -hmm. But I also like to give a custom pre-approval based on the offer the client is making. Okay. So if you're looking at a house, if you're pre-approved up to 600,000, and you're looking at a house for 500,000 and you want to make an offer of 510, the sellers don't need to know you qualify mm -hmm. for 600. They only need to know you qualify for 510. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to give away your bargaining power. So that's how I prefer to do it. So get out there with your realtor, start looking. Um, you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to put in probably more than one offer. It's rare that your first offer gets accepted nowadays. Right. It happens right. Right. Um, if you're an optimist too, <laughs> right. but um, you know, make those offers and and get and get yourself out there. And the realtor's job is to pick what you you tell them what you want to look at, and then they'll show you those properties and advise you on whether that property is worth what they're asking or how to offer or you know just basically give you your information and, and they're your buyer's agent so they're going to protect your interests on that purchase and negotiate for you and find out all the little background things that you may need need to know about that property now do lenders get involved at all in the requirement or suggestion for home inspections no no, that is completely between um, the buyer and the realtor as to how they decide to move forward. Some people are um, walking away from doing home inspections, which is a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. I agree. There are ways to do it that will not affect, um, that might make it easier for you to get your offer accepted, but you should always in some way, shape or form get a home inspection done. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to walk into something and then find out that you know, it's it's above and beyond, mm -hmm. but we as loan officers uh, don't get involved in that. So what other recommendations would you s tell them before they go out into the field to start looking? Um, don't open any new credit accounts. Don't let anyone run your credit for any reason. If you go into Old Navy and they say you're gonna save 10%, if you open a new card, don't do that. You know, or no buy a new car. Yeah, don't buy a new car. You know, don't quit your job. Don't yeah. uh, you know? And if you have an issue that you need to do something like that, call me. We'll have a conversation about yeah. it, and and we can we can decide. All right, well, if you do it this way, it might work better. But just keep everything as very simple and status quo as you can. Yeah. And and I've heard of story, horror stories of people that went out and purchased their furniture yeah. in advance and. That throws the whole thing out of whack. Yes, I have. I had a guy who went out and opened a brand uh, a, a credit card at Bernie and Phil's yeah. and bought all the furniture for his house. And then when we went and re-ran his credit three days prior to closing, um, he, he couldn't qualify for the house anymore. So he had to 
undo it all and 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 cancel the whole thing and we had yeah. to prove and, it, and it, it caused a lot of problems he did wind up closing but it, it definitely complicated things so let's let's talk about um timing issues mm -hmm. uh, from the time that someone uh finds a house works with a um, realtor on an offer mm -hmm. uh, and quickly goes through a pns mm -hmm. how long does it take is that what you need actually to move the loan forward? To move the loan forward, I technically need uh, a signed contract. Okay. All right. So up until the point where I have a signed contract, it's uh, a pre-approval, and then f from the signed contract, it is now um, and it's an official loan, and we have to disclose the loan documents. Okay. And um, so there's timing, federal rules on that, and how how soon you have to do it. But generally speaking, from the time you get a purchase and sale in your hand, we can close. Uh, relatively quickly, um, usually within 30 days is not an unreasonable time span. Mm -hmm. um, depend, but we can also extend it. So if the seller wants to take 60 days to close, we can make that happen too. Mm -hmm. So um, some of those issues will change what your interest rate is. Um, the longer you lock your rate for, the higher the rate is. Um, but there's ways that we can maneuver around making that work as well. So that can also be part of your negotiating with the seller. So it's much easier with someone not selling a house at the same time they're buying a house, but why don't you talk through those issues a little bit? Um, you, what ha the, the problem with having a house to sell when you make an offer is the seller on the house you're, you're, you want to buy is going to, they may have an issue with waiting for you to sell your mm -hmm. house. And they would, if they've got five offers on the table and four of them do not have a contingency to mm -hmm. sell a house, um, it's, it's more likely they'll take the one without the contingency. However, so that means if you want them to take your offer and wait, you're going to have to pay more. Mm -hmm. So you're going to wind up paying a little bit more for that house. And then you're in a hurry to sell your house, so you might wind up taking a little bit less when you sell your house to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's actually a better idea right now to put your property under agreement and ask your ask your buyers, put your house on the market, accept an offer from a buyer who will give you some time to go out and get a property mm -hmm. under under agreement because mm -hmm. then you're, it's a contingent offer, but you already have an accepted offer. Mm -hmm. um, we have people now who are selling their houses, taking the money, moving into temporary housing, and then shopping for a house. Um, so, you know, there are ways to make it happen, but the way houses are selling so quickly now, the having a house to sell and having it on the market is the best way to go because it's going to sell quickly. So you've been doing this for a while. Yeah. What's different now than five years ago? Five years ago, pre-COVID, um, five years ago was kind of a sweet spot because Pre-COVID and after the, the 2008 meltdown of the, of mm -hmm. the market, there was, uh, there was a, a few years in there, like, you know, 17, 18, 19, where rates were at 5% in the, in the fives, five and a quarter percent, five and a half, and, you know, bumping up a little bit up towards six and in, in, in that whole 5% area. And that's generally a really um, good real estate market. So um, sales were good, they were steady, um, prices were, you know, a house would sit on the market, if it was priced properly, it would be on the market for about 30 to 45 days. And it would get one offer. And then when COVID hit and um, the interest rates dropped, then people were refinancing like crazy. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of refinancing. And people, were, that's when the inventory started to back off. People didn't want to sell their houses because of COVID. They were staying where they were. But then we had a higher market because people wanted to get out of the city and they were afraid of staying in the city and they wanted to move to the country and they were all wanted houses where they could have an office and work from home. Mm -hmm. So the demand increased, but the supply did not. Mm -hmm. And it got worse over 21 and into 22. And then when when things started to go south with uh, lack of, you know, with the lack of inventory, right. that's when it, re it really um, got difficult. So um, I very much appreciate being on the show. Thank you. Um, following our timing as closely as I can. Yep. Uh, but I um, wanted you to share your contact information for the sure. public. 
Great. Um, my contact information, my cell phone is 781-801-0939. And my email address is dcolonino. That's D-C-O-L-A-N-I-N-O at shamrockcmg.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the cold hands. No, <laughs> cold, it's cold, cold today. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you so much. Welcome back to the Register Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deans of Plymouth County. I want to thank Deborah Colonino for the great job she did um, with her company, uh, explaining her company, Shamrock Loans, and what is happening in the mortgage market. We all know rates have gone up. Uh, they've gone up significantly over the last couple of years. Not historically high, but relative to the past couple of years high. And she talked about some programs and, and the ways that you can get uh, pre-qualified before you go looking for property. Uh, we always talk about some of the holidays of the month. There was an election day in the city, Veterans Day on the 11th, um, National Fast Food Day on the 16th, a big holiday in Plymouth County, Thanksgiving, coming up on the 23rd. And we'll go to some of our uh, notable land records. Uh, Grover Cleveland owned land in Plymouth County. Grover Cleveland was one of the presidents of the United States. He is the only president in the United States to win election, lose an election, and then come back and win an election. And I know there is a candidate out there now trying to be hopeful for that result. We'll see where it goes. Uh, Grover Cleveland was a great outdoors person. He loved good food, beverages, and being outside. He duck hunted and fished a lot within Plymouth. He actually bought a parcel of land in Manomet. I never built on it, um, but um, um, ended up building a house or moving to a house on the other side of the Cape over in Bourne. But he's certainly um, a very well recognized president. The next notable record is a um, notable record relative to Veterans Day. Uh, there is an area of Plymouth on the Plymouth Kingston line called the New Guinea Settlement at Parting Ways. Um, the town of Plymouth gave 94 acres of land to these four black Revolutionary War veterans. Um, and they settled there and built a, um, a place for them and their descendants to live. Um, it is located on Route 80 in West Plymouth. And you can actually park your car and look at, um, at the property. Some, some um, foundations still left, a couple marble tablets, some of the gravestones. But for a long time, it was a very healthy and thriving uh, community. Uh, it is on the federal and state registers of historic places and protected by federal and state laws. Next one is related to the Thanksgiving holiday. Everyone remembers John Alden. He was the cooper on the Mayflower, meaning he was in charge of the beer. Water didn't travel so well back in those days, so the healthiest thing to drink when they passed was beer. Uh, when they made it, made it over from, from um, England, um, he came at the age of 20, and he, um, rather than going back to England like he originally planned to, he met a woman by the name of Priscilla Mullins, and there's an incredible story very well told, maybe a little mythically, in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Courtship of Miles Standish. A little sad for Miles Standish, but a big win for John Alden. There is a J Alden home in the town of Duxbury, a really nice place to visit, um, and um, uh, certainly one of our great locations to visit of historical places in Plymouth County. Um, it was believed that the Alden House was built 
as early as 1653, a lot of people moved out of the main settlement of Plymouth and moved up to Duxbury, um, what is now Kingston in Marshfield, and then later Situate. But it's um, part of the great story of the Plymouth Colony. Uh, and last but not least, every year since the Plymouth 400, we've always shared one of our Plymouth Colony records. And this record talks about a law back in the 16. 51, when, when the colonists voted a law to establish what basically was a grand jury. They created an inquest, and if you were found to have reason to go to trial, you would go to trial uh, by a jury of your peers, only men at that time. We've talked about the colonists deciding to have a uh, right to trial by jury. Uh, very early, and um, it is very similar to our grand jury process today. Uh, there's so many things from the colony records in the 1600s that were foundations for things we have in America today, and certainly are, are very important of the growth of our great country. So um, I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I want to thank Michelle Hepsey here at Brockton Cable Access for her help. Last time I was here, she was a rookie. She had only done a couple shows. Now she's done 30 or 40, and you can tell she's very much grown her skills because she ran the whole show today, from the cameras to the control room. So thank you, Michelle. And please have a happy and safe Thanksgiving, everybody.